thank you for the introduction. Again, my name is Yao Hui Chen. Today I want to talk about how we will write the ARM64 card binaries so that they can enjoy the protection of SQL-only memory. This is a joint work between Stony Brook University and Samsung Research America. Um, so the names in black are people from Stony Brook, namely me, Dong Li Zhang, Ri Chao, and my advisor, Long Lu. And the names in blue are people from Samsung Research, namely Rowan Wang, Ahmed Azab, Hayo Fijia Kuma, and Wen Bosun. So first of all, uh, what is, sorry, what is SQL-only memory, or ZOM, and why it is useful? So this primitive was first introduced by researchers from Stanford and UC Berkeley back in the 90s. They said that code contents cannot be viewed in the memory, and around that time, they used ZOM to prevent the software piracy. In recent years, ZOM has another calling, which is to help defend against the dynamic memory disclosure-based code reuse attacks in which the attacker first leak a code pointer and then use a memory disclosure primitive to dynamically harvest the code gadgets so that without any a priori knowledge about the binary layout, the attacker can uh, assemble the gadgets and then hijack the control flow. So naturally, if we use ZOM to prevent the gadgets from being read, we can stop the attacker at step two. And recent years, hardware vendors start to keep up. For example, in ac 6 you have EPT and memory protection keys. And in ARM64, you have zone directly configurable from kernel. And here is the earliest kernel patch that I found that tries to enable zone on ARM64 platforms. You can see that it dates back to May 2014, which is three years ago. So why after three years this primitive is still not massively in use yet? Well, it turns out one of the major reasons is that um, it's non-trivial to enable zone for COD binaries. For example, in this figure, it shows the memory layout of the COD binaries. And um, you can see that in this memory page, there are code and data interleaved together. And because zone can only be enforced at page granularity, that means all the data inside this memory page are non-readable, which uh, will break the program. So a very high level idea would be first you separate the code and data into different pages and then you still need to properly update all the references because if you miss any of the reference, this will break the program as well. Um, let me first explain why the memory layout looks like that. So basically this is a legacy issue. Back in the old days when people tried to make the, ELF, the ELF file standard, they did not consider read only or ask only and ask only as incompatible. As a result, they put those um, read-only data sections together with the code content in order to get a more compact binary. In consequence, you have uh, those ELF headers and those metadata sections such as GNU hash are placed together with the code sections such as uh, PLT and text. Note that there are three thin orange bars inside the .text section that represents the inline data. Um, and after the text, you have the read-only uh, data sections and EH frame sections. Uh, they are also read-only but placed together with those code contents. So other than the code data locations, um, regarding the references for a normal ELF binary, you have intersection references, intersection references, and lastly, you have even references from the external module. For example, the dynamic loader will want to access the uh, ELF header and those metadata sections. So does the C++ runtime. That means by only examining this, uh, one, uh, this module itself, you cannot comprehensively resolve all the references. If this situation is not messy enough for you uh, to scare you away from trying to solve this, what about there are still some unknown references from the external module? For example, in our experiments, we found that the Android R runtime wants to access the read-only section of the cycle binary. So now let's revisit the high-level idea again. Firstly, you want to identify the SQL data. Throughout the talk, I will use SQL data um, as this term uh, to refer to all the orange area inside this figure. So you see that because inline data are still prevalent in unbinaries, so there are past research has shown that under such situation, to te uh, telling data apart from code precisely is in principle undecidable. Regarding the references, hopefully I have convinced you it's very hard, if not impossible, to comprehensively resolve all these references. So facing such challenges, we made the following design goals for NORCs. Uh, firstly, regarding a code data separation, we want to have an analysis with very high precision. 
uh, we uh, want to make practical trade-offs, which means that we want a superset of the SQL data, but only a subset of the references, which will result in something like this. In this figure, the green ring represents the data collection results that we want, uh, but on the right side, this small blue greenish ring represents actually the missed references. So, because of these trade-offs, we also have the security goal such that we want to expose as less code as possible, meaning that these green rings will be very small. And we also want to enforce this um, runtime security policy-based checks to tell apart the attackers from the legitimate missed references. And we also want NUX to be very practical by having low runtime and memory overhead. And NUX should not be exclusive to other code binary hardening solutions such as fine-grained code randomization and the CFI. Also, NUX binaries should be backward compatible, meaning that um, the rewritten binaries, they can even run seamlessly on other ARM64 platforms, even without NUX support. And lastly, we want to enforce ZOM on a modular basis. So, now let me show you the high-level NUX components uh, and, uh, and how they work together to achieve these design goals. First of all, you, uh, we have this undisassembler, which will collect the superset of the SQL data, as well as the intro module references. And then these results will be fed to, uh, will be fed to a patcher, which will calculate the new binary layout and then repackage the binary. And then this repackaged binary can be loaded by a loader during load time that will update all the collected references, also enable zone on a modular basis. You see that because we only update the references at load time, this again preserves the backward compatibility. And lastly, during runtime, we have a monitor as a runtime module that will handle the missed references as well as perform this access policy check. In this work, we use Android as our reference platform. Um, before I dive in into how a disassembler works, I want to first share with you some background so that you can know the rationale behind a disassembler's analysis. First of all, in ARM64 ISA, they say that uh, the instructions are all 4 by aligned and has fixed size. Also, the PC register is no longer directly accessible, and the most importantly, they only uh, expose a very limited set of instructions to perform PC relative addressing. And this, combined with the fact that since Android 5.0, Google has removed the non-PIE loading from the dynamic loader, which means that uh, if you have purchased your Android phone within the last three years, chances are that all the binaries inside the phone are positioned independent. So bearing in mind these two observations, let's see how a disassembler works. First of all, it starts with a linear sweep, which will give us an over-approximate set of instructions represented by the green area. and then. It does this what we call guided data collection. So remember, we observed that only a limited set of instructions can be used to collect the, uh, obtain the PC relative addresses. And uh, so we base our analysis on this um, limited set of instructions, namely the LDR literal and ADR ADRP. And we check the data load operations initiated by these instructions. So this will give us a very precise set of the data represented by these three orange bars in the green area. And then um, chances are that this set of data is still not complete because um, while we are checking the, uh, the, the code, um, if we encounter some memory operations or indirect branch instructions that we cannot resolve, then we lost the check. In such a situation, we mark the current tracking data as unbounded and then perform this unbound data expansion which will exp uh, expand the, the um, current check data backwards and forwards until we reach a valid instruction. By valid instruction, I mean that during the backward expansion, we stop at either the direct branch instruction with the valid targets or a indirect branch instructions, which we will check the um, used register certified the API property. And during the forward expansion, we stop at either the targets from a valid direct branch instruction, a valid branch instruction, or a sound set of function starts that we obtain using static analysis. So after this step, a superset of the executable data are collected. Uh, then a disassembler will go ahead to, um, to collect the intro module references, which could come from a list, uh, this following list of uh, sections. So for the sake of time, I won't, have, uh, I won't dive into detail for this part, but in the paper we discuss uh, what kind of program practice will result in the references from these sections. So if you um, are interested in this detail, please refer to our paper. 
And then this result is given to Apache, which will uh, calculate the new memory layout, specifically the new location of the SQL data, in which process it also takes into consideration the reference addressing range, and it will emit a stop code to help access this relocated data, uh, this new data location, if necessary. And, um, and then Apache will uh, append the noise related metadata to the end of the ELF. This, again, is to uh, ensure the backup compatibility. So the noise related metadata includes the duplicate inline data, the references locations and displacement, uh, the stop code, and lastly, the noise header that can tell a loader where to locate this metadata. So during load time, a loader performs three of these subtasks. Uh, tagged with LD1, LD2, and LD3. Uh, in LD1, it set up the noise bookkeeping data, which I will discuss in the next slide. Also, map the SQL data to the new location uh, accordingly. And in LD2, it redirects all the dynamic loader accesses to the new readable location by updating the dynamic session. And lastly, in LD3, it adjusts all the references and then enables on, on, on a modular basis. I want to show you how a loader works with uh, this simplified uh, program loading process. So first of all, you start with the SQL loading. You can see we do LD1 and LD2 accordingly. And then the control flow is transferred to the dynamic loader, which will load all the dependence libraries. And uh, for each one of the, uh, the module, we also do LD1 and LD2. And after all the modules required by the process are properly loaded, uh, the dynamic loader will go ahead to perform simple resolution and relocation, and we do LD3 at this point. You see, we do it here because uh, some of the references are only available during this time, for example, those uh, from the GOT section. And uh, by doing LD3 here, we have a higher coverage on the references. Lastly, the program can start and run. So if you have the question, what if the program load the library during runtime? You can see that because of our traces of timing to perform these three subtasks, this is naturally handled by a loader by doing this uh, step two and step three again. So during runtime, um, a monitor will help resolve these missed references and uh, also perform these default policy checks, uh, uh, policy checks. And uh, currently, we have a default policy uh, that we made based on our experience. Uh, which we believe strike a very good balance between compatibility and security. Basically, the policy says that the code can only access this identified superset of the SQL data region. Also, for the inline data, they should only be allowed for their hosting functions, which are these over approximated ranges that we obtain using static analysis. And lastly, for compatibility reasons, we mark the conventional file headers and those non code regions as whitelisted for now. And on the right side, this is the bookkeeping data I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, so in this linked list, each node is, uh, represents a module in a process. And you can see that each one of them has their own uh, policy and whitelist, which will allow the need to adjust them if necessary. So we believe this policy does not hurt security for the following two reasons. First of all, even the attacker can read the SQL data region. This, uh, Parts uh, mostly contains only invalid data. For example, it looks like this. So they, are, they cannot be executed. And for the second reason, because of the policy about the inline data, uh, now the attacker needs to use multiple memory disclosure bugs in order to explore the executable data in different areas. So now that I have finished uh, introducing how NOISE works, I want to compare it with a set of related works from the angle of how to enable zone. So in the first line of works, they enable zone by uh, recompiling and relinking the program so that the binary emitted by the toolchain when loaded will have code and data separated nicely. Um, but this requires source code. On the second line of work, um, they provide a very handy static analysis to identify a subset of SQL data, which um, uh, is good, but it's not enough for our purpose. And we believe the most comparable work to NOX is HIDEM. HIDEM also wants to identify the superset of SQL data, and here is how HIDEM works. Um, so this figure, inside this figure, those green rings represent the function node of a call graph in the program. And HIDEM starts from the entry point and then from this recursive disassembly and then also as well as some static analysis to identify this subset of the call graph. And then they mark everything else as data. 
You see that because of the limitation of static analysis, they inevitably will identify some code as, as data. So compare uh, with uh, HIDEM, these two works actually have their own advantages. For example, in the, um, in the scope of ARM64, NORX is more precise uh, because it, its analysis depends on specific ARM64 ISO knowledge. But uh, HIDEM's approach is actually architecture independent. Um, they can handle other architectures such as x86. And because of that, their disassembler is also robust against the erroneous disassembly, which is naturally not a problem for ARM64 anyway. And uh, uh, NORX is more systematic because it can handle, it has a higher coverage on the references, and also NORX is uh, enabled on the real world mobile systems. So I want to um, show you our evaluation results. So in our evaluation, we use three sets of the um, binaries. In the set S1, it consists of 313 64-bit system binaries. They are all stripped, dumped from the commercial phones, and we use them to perform our data analysis. And then in set S2, we select 20 of the critical system binaries, and then uh, convert them, and then run our functionality test. In the last set, we use Unix Bench to measure the runtime and memory overhead. So regarding the data analysis, um, so we use set S1, in which process we observe 132 out of 313 binaries has reported inline data. And 43 of them during the analyze process, they require this unbound data expansion, which means that the rest of the 132 uh, binaries can be uh, analyzed nicely with the uh, guided data collection. And in this process, we also observe uh, 28 of binaries has reported more, uh, we have identified more code as data. Uh, but regarding the data missed, we do not miss any. But this is after we uh, manually filter the unreferenced data, such as the paddings and signature strings, etc. Because making them unreadable will not break the program, so we do not count them as uh, false negatives. We also observe that in this, uh, among these binaries, libm, libart, and libiq18 and the SOs has reported much more inline data than other analyzed binaries. And regarding the functionality test, we converted those uh, critical system binaries, including the QCCOMD, the Qualcomm driver, or, and those important system daemons such as Zygote, uh, InstallD, Service Flinger, et cetera. They are used to support your day-to-day -day tasks, such as launching up a new, a new application, making phone call, or render frame buffer, et cetera. We also uh, converted the low-level complex libraries, such as libc, libm, and then uh, we, uh, we enable them, and during our functionality test, we did not observe any failure. Uh, lastly, we uh, run the uh, Unix bench binaries. Uh, we converted them and then run them on this Qualcomm Snapdragon A A08 chip with two gigabyte memory, also known as the Nexus 5S phone. And um, we compare it with the original binaries. And in this process, we observe the uh, average runtime overhead, peak memory overhead, and the file size overhead are all negligible. And um, notice that uh, there's one uh, benchmark, which is exact, uh, CL um, that has much higher uh, runtime overhead, because this, uh, this benchmark actually is doing a stress testing on the exact C, uh, um, syscall testing. It is just keep calling uh, exact on itself, and this will trigger our bookkeeping data setup and keep um, in triggering this locking unlocking mechanism. That's the reason why uh, th this uh, exhibits higher overhead. So, in summary, we firstly perform a systematic study of the code data separation problem on uh, those called binaries. And NORX is the first comprehensive solution for enabling ZOOM on ARM64 platforms in which it makes practical trade-offs to tackle the in-principle undecidable code data separation problem. It enhances the security such that it exposes very last code uh, to the attacker and also enforces this runtime-based policy checks. And NORX features the practical design uh, such that it supports the modular ZOOM enforcement. It covers as killable as well as libraries, and those common practices such as runtime library loading. And uh, NORX binaries are backward compatible. You can run these converted binaries even on other uh, stock ARM64 phones with, uh, with, uh, uh, seamlessly. And um, also, NORX is non-exclusive. Although I didn't discuss explicitly in the talk, but uh, NORX does not introduce any change to the data flow and core graph property of the program. 
Lastly, we perform large-scale evaluation on real-world mobile system binaries, in which we show that um, noise can precisely collect the data. Also, the rewritten binary incurs negligible runtime and memory overhead. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and take any questions you might have. So can you, can you comment on the applicability of your techniques on x86, which is uh, clearly more complex than... Um... Exactly. Uh, so why we have the confidence to say that this can cover ARM64 is because of uh, you know, the specific ARM64 instruction set architecture. And because they only have this limited set of instructions that can be used to obtain the PC relative addresses. And this does not uh, exhibit on the x86 architecture. So uh, this is not applicable to uh, x86. Right. Right, let's thank the speaker again.